Well, good morning. Uh, it's time for us to uh, start this session on uh, theories of uh, the rate of interest. You've covered a lot of ground in uh, two and a half days, and um, hopefully you've seen that the, um, the causal realist or Austrian, the Mengerian, Misesian, Austrian uh, approach um, emphasizes or uh, uh, holds up as the uh, uh, basis for economic analysis, uh, the real human person engaged in real human action. And uh, the study of economics is what laws of operation of the human mind are in motion through action to organize the elements of the real world external to the mind uh, for, uh, as means for the attainment of ends. And this becomes particularly uh, interesting when we're talking about a society where we have lots of different people, right, who interact uh, with uh, uh, divergent uh, skills and uh, goals and uh, so on. So we've covered a lot about uh, this week so far about, uh, about these laws of utility, the laws of uh, valuing things and choosing. And you talked some about uh, how uh, the human mind through uh, human uh, intelligence is able to perceive uh, how uh, objects in the world can be used uh, as means to the attainment of the things that they value, the ends that they value. Um, how, uh, as human beings, we have the uh, ability to make judgments and to prefer uh, you know, one course of action to another, one set of means to pursue uh, an end as opposed to another set of means. We have the ability, we have a, you know, the creative, imaginative ability to anticipate the outcome of particular courses of action and to uh, this, this entrepreneurial element that you've uh, heard about um, and arrange, uh, you know, for an economizing result. Uh, so th this is uh, uh, the groundwork, right, that we've uh, built up uh, to this point. <clears throat> what we haven't spent too much uh, analytical time discussing, though, is the element of time. And uh, you know, some things have been said about this, but uh, in this uh, talk, we'll uh, flesh this out to a, a greater degree. And just like with these other elements that I've spoken about, we want to begin with the human person. We just want to think about, you know, how does time, how is it relevant? How do we see it uh, in, in the logical sense? How is it logically related to uh, the way in which we act uh, through our valuations of things. <clears throat> and then we'll see how this uh, uh, manifests itself on the market. Right? So that this is the, always the way that we proceed in, in uh, economic analysis. <clears throat> now, let me introduce a, f a few terms just so we uh, can make distinctions that, uh, uh, that we, uh, are necessary in this uh, process. When we talk about the human valuing of action with respect to time, uh, there are two distinct elements of this, two distinct aspects of valuing action with respect to time. The first uh, we'll call, by the way, this terminology I'm following uh, Frank Fetter, who was uh, the great American economist of the Austrian school in the early 20th century. And Fetter says that uh, on the one hand, we, we have what he calls time value. And by that, he means the timing of an action. So a given action might have different value for us depending on when we take the action in time. And so we can value the action with respect to its temporal placement in time, today or tomorrow or the next week or you know, at 11 o'clock or at 12 o'clock or at 9 o'clock or that, that sort of thing. And then the second uh, valuing aspect of time is what uh, is called time preference, and, and hence we get the, the title here uh, of our uh, talk. And time preference is obviously related to the interest rate, or this, this is the argument that you'll uh, uh, entertain here. But anyway, time preference uh, does something different. Uh, time value, again, says I have a given action that I can, I can uh, possibly take at different moments in time, and then I value taking that action with respect to my judgment as to uh, you know, how much value I'd, I would get or satisfaction I would get from taking the action today or tomorrow or you know, at 11 o'clock or at 12 o'clock or what, whatever my choice parameters are. So it's a given action that might have different value at different moments in time. Time preference does something else. It, it, it's entirely separable conceptually. 
Time preference says, suppose I take an action and I get a given satisfaction no matter when I take the action. No matter when. I get exactly the same satisfaction. I can take the action today or tomorrow or the whenever. But the satisfaction is exactly the same. Then the question is, for a given satisfaction, would I prefer to have this satisfaction sooner in time or later? If I can act get a, to get a given uh, benefit, in the abstract now, would I prefer this benefit sooner as opposed to later? Now this we call intertemporal, the intertemporal dimension of time. So we have a temporal dimension and an intertemporal dimension. Okay, this is just terminology, I'm just, right? So we're just uh, uh, defining the, the relevant uh, concepts. <clears throat> okay, so now let's go on to the, to the analytical part. Uh, we're not gonna spend very much time with the temporal aspect of action as I've defined it the timing of an action. This is a very interesting area, and we would cover this actually in financial markets. This is the, the basis for uh, uh, forward transactions in, in financial markets. And so th this is a very important area of economic uh, analysis, very important area of the real world. We have financial markets and uh, you know uh, futures and, uh, uh, and, and so on, and, and we wanna be able to analyze all this. But, but here we're, gonna, we're just going to mention this for contrast to intertemporal valuing, uh, just so we're, we're very clear uh, that we're not mixing these things together, right? That we're not, it's a very important that we keep them analytically separable. <clears throat> okay, so we mentioned already that uh, the temporal uh, aspect of action has to do with taking a given action at different moments in time and getting a different value. Uh, just to give you a, a simple illustration, um, uh, my wedding anniversary is August 18th, August 18th, 1983. <laughs> okay, so, uh, you know, we'll, my wife and I will celebrate our anniversary. Now, we could choose to celebrate the anniversary. I could choose to kind of surprise her and, you know, have an anniversary party for her any day of the year, uh, right? I could do it tomorrow. But I know that the value of doing it will not be the same. If I do it on, you know, July 28th, yeah, she would she would look at me. You know, she might think that's you know sweet or something, but it uh, is more meaningful on the anniversary date. Right? So so that that's what we're speaking about. We have we have a, a given action, but the value that accrues to us is different depending on when we take it. Okay, uh, and so what we what we do, of course, is we allocate then our resources to attain with this in mind. We you know there are other aspects of valuing with respect to action. Uh, you know, as well, but, you know, if we're just thinking about this element of time, uh, of the timing of an action, we'll tend to take an action uh, at that moment in time when we think the value is the greatest. There may be other things that are, we consider when we actually choose, right? But that, but that would be a part of the decision-making uh, aspect. <clears throat> now, when we do this, if, if it's possible for us to engage in uh, additional action, in my example, that wouldn't be, well, it would, it would be silly for me to try to do that, right? I'd, we'd celebrate our anniversary, let's say, at 5 o'clock in the evening on August 18th, and then when we got done, you know, I'd say, let's do it again at 10 o'clock. You know, so that, that would be silly, but the reason it's silly is because of diminishing marginal utility, right? It, it, <laughs> the utility diminishes for the, the same unit of the good, uh, you, you know, an additional unit of the good. So we, you've dealt with that principle before. So that's what happens when we allocate with respect to timing, right? Diminishing marginal utility occurs, and so we allocate through time this temporal aspect in such a way that we balance the, the marginal utilities across time just like we would balance the marginal utilities across goods, right? So, so it, it's the same principle that you've heard uh, already. Uh, it's just now applied uh, with respect to time. Now, I mentioned uh, what this, uh, how this manifests itself in the market is in forward prices. So let's say, for example, let's say that speculators in the oil industry think that, uh, you know, the cheap oil's over and, uh, you know, the next six months uh, demand's going to go up or there's going to be supply disruptions or something. And so they think that the six months from now, the price of oil will be much higher. Well, then they can engage, you know, if, if, the, if the, uh, 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 the actual forward price w was pretty close to the spot price, 
of oil, they could then uh, arbitrage that difference, right? Because they think the, the price six months from now will be much higher. They can engage in forward contracts. This is what they would do to uh, you know, acquire oil uh, in the future at that lower price that the market is assessing the, the oil. And then they think it's going to I think it's going to occur, right? But as they do that, they bid the price up. So they increase the demand, and then and the, pri the Ford price would be bid up. As the Ford price is bid up, then the suppliers will supply more into the future, right? They'll agree to these forward contracts, and they won't supply the oil today. They'll supply it six months from today. They'll enter into these contracts because, again, they're arbitraging this. They're earning profit by doing this, right? They're just arbitraging the oil. And so that process is, is constantly going on in, uh, in financial markets, this process of temporal arbitrage. Right? And, and this is bringing about efficient allocation of the resources for temporal uh, allocation. <clears throat> so the market is even efficient in this respect. Uh, but again, as I said, this is just, a, uh, this is just an ancillary point to our talk. We want to uh, focus on uh, intertemporal action. And this is uh, intertemporal action comes from time preference, which we've already pointed out is a separate valuing uh, aspect of uh, action with respect to time. Uh, here's the definition again of time preference, the satisfaction of an end, a given satisfaction from attaining an end sooner is preferred to the same satisfaction later. You know, this is an abstract uh, point, right? It's a satirist paribus claim. It's a, con a conjectural claim. Now, it should be pointed out that uh, this claim is embedded, though, in the logic of action. We're not talking about psychological dispositions. We're not talking about whether people are impatient or something. That people can be impatient, but you know, some people are uh, not impatient. <laughs> what we're talking about is not a psychological aspect of action, which can vary from one person to another, but a logical aspect of action that must be true for all people. This is the claim, anyway, about time preference. Now, it's true that impatient people, their intensity of time preference is affected by their patience, right? So, so patient people tend to be what we call low time preference people, and impatient people tend to be high time preference people. But, but that's, uh, uh, that's just a question. That, that's just a, uh, a uh, question of uh, variation, right? It's just, by the way, it's exactly the same thing with the concept of preference, the concept of preference, we prefer one thing to another, is a logically necessary feature of human action. It, it, everybody has preference when they act. And then, you know, so, so there, we can have different degrees of preferring one thing to another, right? And that's based on our psychology and, you know, our circumstances and so on and so forth. Uh, but the idea of preference is logically uh, 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 necessary, really, to understand human action itself. So we're making the same claim. Mises makes the same claim about uh, time preference. <clears throat> uh, let, let me try one last. You know, this is it, it, uh, when you first hear this, it does, you know, it's sort of hard to grasp this at first. But let me let me try this. Uh, so let me try this one other way. We know that. Um, because of the finitude of human existence or of all material existence, it's finite and not infinite, that when we act, we only get, uh, in, uh, we don't get uh, indefinite effects, right? We don't, when we, when we eat one time, it doesn't satisfy our hunger forevermore, right? It, it's true of every action because we're finite. And, and it follows directly from that that we always prefer more of a good to less of a good. We always do. There's no, it can't be otherwise. Because we always have unmet ends that more goods could satisfy because we're unable with our, with our goods to act once for all to satisfy every end. Only you know, a superhuman being could do such a thing. Maybe it's impossible conceptually, but you know, we can't do it as human beings. So it's the same thing about our temporal existence. If we exist in time, if we're, if we're temporally bound in time, then it just logically follows that sooner satisfaction is always preferred to later. It's just, it's just necessary. It's a necessary feature of preference expressed intertemporally. Just like more is always preferred to less, sooner is always preferred to later. It, it, it couldn't be otherwise. This is how the argument runs anyway. So it's, it's very, you kind of have to grapple with this a little bit to wrap your head around it, right? But it's, it's the quintessential uh, praxeological area, right? 
this, this distinction between what's logically necessary in action and what's just uh, contingent, mm -hmm. circumstances and psychology and, and so on and so forth. <clears throat> uh, okay, uh, one other thing about time preference, we want to make sure that we, we, we uh, um, uh, understand that uh, time preference, just like preference, is always forward-looking. So when we talk about time preference, we're, we're always, what we're saying is, just like with preference, we're always saying a person is anticipating the future state of affairs when they make their choice and the end is realized in the future. Right? Time preference has nothing to do with looking backward. And, and so no, just like preference, it's always entrepreneurial. It's always looking forward. And, and so that's important to keep in mind. <clears throat> okay, so this then generates in the market the pure rate, what we'll call the pure rate of interest, where uh, some people with lower time preference uh, then can satisfy the higher time preference of other people by lending present money to these high time preference people so that they can satisfy their more intense present desires. And as long as they're willing to pay an interest payment to the low time preference people, the low time preference people can be mutually satisfied, right? Because they get greater future satisfaction than they get present satisfaction, <clears throat> uh, than the present satisfaction they give up. So this is the idea. The intertemporal allocation of uh, resources among people can be uh, improved by this mutually advantageous trade uh, through uh, uh, credit markets or through, through what we more generally call the time market. So that's what we want to explore <clears throat> uh, in this period. Okay, now let, let me try to uh, encapsulate this in, uh, in a kind of systematic uh, framework way for you to uh, consider. So in the top line of this uh, schematic, I've, I've, I've just uh, put out the logical flow of the argument about preference and how it affects the price of a consumer good. So let's say, for example, we're looking at the market for apples and so people have preferences for apples. There's some people who you know, don't have these apples and they desire to acquire them. And there are other people who have maybe grown the apples in the past or they've, maybe they bought some apples somewhere and now they wish to dispose of a few or at least at some price they'd be willing to do this. So we have different preferences and our preferences then lead to demand and supply for this consumer good, apples in my example. And then the, as you've learned already, the, uh, the argument is that since it's mutually advantageous for people to trade, they'll, they'll uh, negotiate or find the price at which they, they can make their trades. <laughs> and we call this the market clearing price, at which all their trades are feasible. All the feasible trades can be made, right? So the market, uh, uh, a price for, the, for, uh, for a bag of apples or an apple would emerge. <clears throat> now, I put this up again just so you can consider what you've already learned. It, it's a little bit easier to grasp that part uh, than the time preference part. When we say we have this schematic uh, running in this direction, this, this uh, cause and effect chain uh, of logic, we're not saying that circumstances and psychology and so on don't affect the, the outcome, at least quantitatively, they do. What, what we're saying is that they affect the outcome only through the judgment of human minds who establish a preference with respect to these circumstances. So, so there could be, let's say, there could be fewer apples uh, available that people have. And, you, you know, this, this doesn't have some sort of mechanistic uh, implication for prices. The, the effect on prices depends on how people judge that, those changing circumstances. So, so this is always the way we argue uh, from the causal realist uh, uh, perspective, because our focus is always on the human person. Everything is generated from the human person, the human mind. <clears throat> and so same thing with time preference. We have time preference. People prefer sooner to later satisfaction. And so there can be demand and supply for present money. This is how we trade on uh, intertemporally. We'll talk about this more in, in just a second, why we trade money intertemporally. But then this, uh, you know, the low time preference people, as I suggested before, can uh, lend present money to the high time preference people. And then the interest rate would adjust to clear this market. So, so it's the same argument that we have for any market. And there's no, uh, categorically or logically, it's the same. And notice, once again, this is why I, I want to emphasize this. We're not saying that circumstances and psychology and so on and so forth don't affect the interest rate. 
We're saying the effect on the interest rate comes through our preference. We, we, we have to choose differently in the face of these changing circumstances, right? And then when we choose differently, when we, when our, we make a mental judgment and we say, oh, now my, you know, I prefer to save more because something has happened or I prefer to uh, uh, spend, uh, you know, I need to spend more to attain this, this uh, goal in the present. So my time preference goes up because of this circumstance. The effect on the interest rate depends on that change of mind. Right? And that's something we can't quantify, right? We can't, we can't model this. It's, uh, it, we're human beings. <clears throat> uh, okay. Now, I just wanted also to show you, as long as I put this up, I thought it was uh, useful to just show you the rest of it, how this integrates, how this discussion then integrates into a full-blown theory of prices. So we have the price of a consumer good, let's say again, apples, and then we have an interest rate that would be generated in this market economy, whatever, you know, 5% interest rate or whatever. And then given the price of the consumer good, uh, a marginal revenue product will be generated for hiring factors of production to produce this good. So the prices that are determined here for apples will then uh, impact, along with physical productivity, the, the revenue that can be earned by an entrepreneur from selling the apples that are produced by apple workers, let's say, or by buying uh, seedling trees or whatever the, the productive factor would be, right? The entrepreneur can now estimate or appraise what this revenue will be in the future if labor is hired to prune the apple trees or, we, you know, or to pick the apples or whatever, whatever the entrepreneur's production process looks like. <clears throat> and then if the entrepreneur pays the workers in advance of receiving the revenue from the sale of the output, he'll discount the payment that he makes. His demand for the producer good will be discounted uh, by the pure rate of interest because he's advancing money to the worker and then he's getting his uh, payback in the future, right? So he's always, the entrepreneur, if he pays in advance is, uh, for his factors of production, is always considering the interest rate as a discount on what he'll pay in the present, he's giving up present money, in order to, through production and, and then the sale of the good to get future money, right? So, so that, so that leads us into then demand for producer goods. And then there's an opportunity cost by the suppliers of the producer good. So the, the uh, apple uh, orchard workers would have an opportunity cost, alternatives that they could do, right? And then they self-select into this occupation or the tree seedling growing company uh, has an alternative entrepreneur who, who uh, you know, has an orchard they could sell to. And so they consider this the opportunity cost, right? They consider that as, you know, in, in uh, making a, in establishing their preference to either sell to this, this orchard owner or to, you know, withhold the seedlings for a while and sell into the future to a different orchard owner and so on. And then we get the price of the producer good. So we get the wage for the, for the uh, uh, worker, the apple orchard uh, pruner, and uh, you know the price for the seedling trees, and so on and so forth. It's all this is this too is all generated by our preferences, generated by nothing but our preferences and 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 the given circum you know real physical circumstances of the world, how how we as human beings judge those things mentally, and then make preferences on, you know, establish a, a judgment of value with respect to the options available to us in the real world. Okay. <clears throat> now let's deal, uh, well, let me just show then this, uh, this would be the, uh, the summary graph of uh, what we'll call the time market. And the time market involves all trade of present money on the horizontal axis. <clears throat> Um, and the price of this trade of present money for future money is the interest rate. And we'll use a little r to represent the pure rate of interest is what we want to work with first, and then we'll move on to uh, complications. So there are higher time preference people who demand present money, lower time preference people who supply it. Obviously, the uh, you know, as the graph indicates, right, there's a law of demand, a law of supply, so the, the degree to which people demand or supply depends upon the interest rate itself. Right? So it's just like demand and supply of any good. <clears throat> and then uh, the interest rate would emerge that clears the market. So that's what establishes the interest rate. The, uh, we're saying the pure, pure rate of interest, the time preference discount 
um, of the future or premium for the present. <clears throat> and uh, as we'll uh, uh, mention uh, in a minute, this, um, this peer rate of interest would then permeate all trade of present money for future money. We'll, we'll talk about some of the nuances of this in just a second. But before we do that, we want to talk about um, why it's important to recognize that this trade of present money for future money, this intertemporal trade is done in money. Well, of course, we know that this is true, right? We just look out into the world and we see that, in fact, uh, all lending and borrowing is done in money. It's, people don't lend and borrow in apples or in uh, 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 the backhoes or land or whatever. They, they may again have forward contracts for these things, but they don't trade intertemporally in those things. There's no intertemporal barter. I mean, maybe in history, there, you know, primitive conditions or may have started out with intertemporal barter. But you know, we quickly move to a money economy, then all the intertemporal trade is done in money. And that, it's an interesting question to think about why that's so. And one of the things that Fetter brings out, Frank Fetter brings out about this is that Money isolates the intertemporal aspect of valuing. It, it, it allows us to separate the timing or time value aspect from the intertemporal, the, the uh, uh, time preference aspect. And the reason this is so, again, we're not going to go into a long, uh, detailed argument about this. This is a, uh, you have to ponder this for a while to grasp the nuances. Uh, but let me just uh, state the uh, conclusion, Fetter points out that just like with money being used as a medium of exchange to buy all the different goods in the market economy, each unit of money is equally serviceable in buying any good in the market economy. It doesn't matter which dollar bill I use, right? Or, or, or which, which dollar in my checking account. It, it's all it, it entirely equally serviceable as a, as a medium of exchange across all the goods that I can buy. And Fetter points out this is also true intertemporally. This is because money is the, uh, is the uh, unit of account, right? It is the unit of economic calculation. And so it, timing doesn't matter. Just like what I sp if I spend money on different goods, it doesn't matter for its usefulness as a medium of exchange. It's useful regardless of that, right? And, it's, and Fetter points out it's also useful regardless of whether these goods are temporally displaced. Okay, that's a very interesting point uh, that explains why people trade intertemporally only in money. And then forward transactions are done in goods, right? Goods against money. But, but, but intertemporal trade is present money for future money because the present money and the future money are equally serviceable as a medium of exchange across that time span. Now, now there's some nuances to that that we'll get to in just a second, but, but fundamentally, that, that's the claim that's made. Okay, so that, that's a very, uh, we'll see that this is a very robust uh, 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 claim that uh, Fetter makes. <clears throat> um, okay, so we mentioned already that this uh, pure rate of interest would then permeate all trade of present money for future money whether this was a credit transaction, whether it was just, uh, say, a mortgage in the consumer loan market or, or uh, sovereign uh, uh, government debt or um, a junk bond of a, a company or whatever it might be, right? Or, or production in the capital structure. So for a given time period of present money exchanging for future money, let's say a one-year uh, time period where present money is being given up for future money, the, the underlying pure rate of interest for all of the activity in the economy that has a one-year time structure would be exactly the same. At least in, in equilibrium, right? There could be changes that entrepreneurs haven't anticipated and errors made, but, but the uh, tendency would be for this pure rate of interest to be the same everywhere. Notice uh, this is very important for the business cycle. You've already been introduced, right, to a business cycle theory, but... Because, because what the Fed does through credit expansion is swell the supply of credit. They, they supply just, right, just credit market funding, and they push interest rates down in the credit market. But then there's arbitrage opportunities, because in production, the, the rate of return will be greater. 
And so very quickly, entrepreneurs begin and capitalists begin to arbitrage that, that credit into real production processes. And, and that's where we get the, the distortions of, uh, of the business cycle. So, so this, is, again, is a, a, an important uh, um, conclusion to uh, draw from this. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> okay, now let's get to the nuance that I mentioned. Uh, uh, the pure rate of interest can be uniform across all sim similar duration uh, lending of present money for future money. But that doesn't mean that every market rate of interest uh, of all sorts, uh, you know, depending on the different circumstances of the loans, are the same, right? We know that this is not so. We know that, uh, for example, that uh, uh, AAA uh, corporate bonds of 10-year duration uh, have lower interest rates than uh, junk bonds of 10-year duration. And, and so on, right? We can find all sorts of illustrations of this. So how do, how do we square all that? How do we explain that? W where does that come from? If, if there are arbitrage opportunities, we said before, w why don't the, you know, the capitalists just arbitrage away from the low interest rate return areas and into the high ones and, and eliminate this difference? Well, one factor, of course, we, that I've already alluded to is entrepreneurial uncertainty. The uncertainty involved in the uh, earning of the rate of return in different projects of the same duration is not the same. So shale oil drilling, right, it might command a higher rate of return than apple orchard growing if, if they have the same duration. Uh, simply because of, of the greater uncertainty, the savers are less uh, uh, willing to lend into these processes um, and therefore command higher rates of interest. And the entrepreneurs, the borrowers, are willing to pay the higher rates of interest because they can generate uh, a, a, uh, uh, generate this rate of return in, in the sale of their output. Right. This all again depends, as we suggested before, on the relationship between input and output prices. So, so this is a question for economic calculation of the entrepreneurs. But if they can't generate that extra return, of course, then they, they won't engage in this production. They, they just bypass it. <clears throat> uh, and then there are two different, the, the last two elements have to do with the purchasing power of money over time. So we know that over time, the purchasing power of money can change. And when we talk about the pure rate of interest, we're assuming it's the same. That today, the purchasing power of money, what if it were exactly the same a year from today? Well, then we wouldn't have to worry about changes in the purchasing power of money. But of course, the interest return will depend upon, the actual interest return in real markets will depend upon uh, the, the uh, changing uh, purchasing power of money as we move forward from the lending of present money to the payback in the future. And there are two separate aspects of this. One is called the price premium. And the price premium has to do with um, what we like to call uh, Cantillon effects. So as the money supply or the money relation changes over time, the prices of uh, some goods will go up to a greater extent than the prices of other goods over this period. And the prices of some goods will go up sooner in this period and the prices of other goods later, right? So if you're an entrepreneur producing in a production process where you're getting a greater extent of price increase from changes in the money relation, or you're getting a sooner increase in your output prices, you paid for your inputs, right? And now your output prices suddenly jump up very quickly, <clears throat> then the interest return that you would get is higher. This, this, would be, this would be embedded in the market rate of interest. That is the rate of return. You pay for your inputs, and then you generate output prices, right? And, and that's the rate of return that you get. Uh, we're setting aside, again, profit as, a, as an element of this. And then, finally, there'll be, there'll be unanticipated changes in the purchasing power of money. <clears throat> the overall purchasing power of money could change over time because, again, of uh, uh, changes in the money relation. Now, notice if entrepreneurs perfectly predict this, if they say, look, uh, we're going to engage in this production process, we're ready to buy inputs right now, but we think that the price of uh, our output, the, the, the money, uh, that is the price of our output relative to just the purchasing power of money will be 5% higher than the purchasing power of money today, then they will adjust their demand for the inputs today, right? And when they do that, if they do that, if they correctly anticipate changes in the purchasing power of money, it will have no effect on the interest rate. If they think that prices of output will be going down in the future, 
then they'll just pay less for their inputs today. And as long as they all think this, right, we would get no effect. Prices would simply adjust today and we get no effect on the interest rate. But if they don't anticipate this correctly, then it'll wind up in the interest return. Right? They'll, they'll, they'll get a lower interest return if the purchasing power of money has, has lower, you know, has changed the uh, uh, price of their output, has lowered the price of their output below what they anticipated. Uh, not, not because demand has changed just, uh, for their good, but just because the purchasing power of money has changed. Then their interest return will be lower. Their rate of return will be lower. Their realized rate of return, right? Okay, so again, these are nuances that you have to kind of grapple with, right? And think this through and uh, think, you know, are there objections and, uh, and so on that uh, um, uh, enter into this. Uh, okay, so now we've come to the point of uh, uh, looking at critics. And it's, it's useful to use uh, Boom Bob Works um, approach in thinking about uh, alternative arguments about the rate of interest. <clears throat> and uh, so Boom Bob Works was the great uh, um, proponent of, uh, and uh, analyst, economic analyst of interest rates, right? Wrote a three volume uh, work on capital and interest. And the first volume was devoted to nothing but the history of interest rate theories where he smashes them all. And then the second volume, right, was he, he presented his own theory. And, and, so, and then the third was devoted to just uh, nuance arguments, you know, that uh, arose in the debate that uh, this inspired. <clears throat> but in any case, he, he, uh, he, he uh, analyzed the alternative interest rate theories by posing what he called the interest rate problem. And this is the statement, this is one way of stating the interest rate problem. He says, why is the price of a capital good today not bid up by the entrepreneurs and the capitalists. Why don't they bid the price of it up to, to be equal to the stream of revenue that that capital good generates in the future? Well, why don't they do that? Because after all, if they don't do that, then there's going to be a, a, a gap between the, 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 the sum of the stream of the revenue, right, and the price that they pay today. And wouldn't that be profit? Why, why don't they just jump in to get that? Why don't they arbitrage that away? Uh, that, that's an excellent question, right? That's a really uh, uh, brilliant way of putting the problem. How do you explain this? And of course, uh, we've already seen how the pure time preference theory would explain it. Uh, by the way, Boombavrk himself was not a pure time preference theorist. We'll talk about his, if we have enough time, we'll, <laughs> we'll uh, mention his theory as we go. Uh, but the pure time preference theorists, uh, Frank Fetter, uh, Ludwig von Mises, and Murray Rothbard, and they all argue that th this difference uh, between what is paid for a capital good or an asset today and the full stream of marginal revenue product, the full revenue stream that using that asset generates in the future, the reason why the sum of that revenue stream is greater than what's paid for the asset today is because present money and future money are not equivalent. Present money is worth more than future money. And so less of it has to be paid right, to buy this asset. And uh, uh, this surplus income then is just the difference between the marginal revenue product earned in the future and the discounted marginal revenue product paid today. It's just, a, it's just an intertemporal difference of the value of money. $1,000 in your hand today is worth more than $1,000 in your hand of equal purchasing power five years from today. That, that explains it. <clears throat> By the way, this explanation then uh, covers all the cases, as we mentioned before, it's important to point this out, because an, one alternative theory, of course, is the productivity theory. But this case uh, illustrates, the, the uh, pure time preference case uh, points out that, uh, or, or explains, I should say, uh, the case where there's no production at all, e even if we just have consumer loans. Uh, th uh, there's an interest, a positive interest rate, right? There's no production here at all. So how would the production theory explain that? If the interest rate is generated by the, by the productivity of capital, how does it explain interest rates of consumer loans? Uh, okay, they, maybe they have an explanation. I'm not saying they, they wouldn't necessarily have an explanation, but it seems, uh, you know, that, that seems a problem. It seems sort of a weak that they can't explain it directly. They, they sort of explain it indirectly. But, uh, again, that's for your uh, more advanced reading on these issues. Okay, well, let, let's uh, start with the exploitation theory, just because Bumbavork uh, famously smashed the exploitation theory of Marx uh, that he developed from Ricardo, right? 
And uh, here the, the argument is that interest is just a surplus value of labor that is, that's extracted by the capitalist. Right? So the capitalist can underpay labor, can pay just subsistence uh, to the worker and then gets the full marginal revenue product of the productivity of the worker. Right? So, so that's the basic argument. And as uh, Boom Barbork uh, pointed out, of course, since this is based on the, on the fallacious labor theory of value, it's not, you know, it all falls to the ground once the uh, labor theory of value is smashed, which again, he famously did. In fact, uh, this is one of, the, uh, one of the cases in the history of economic thought where, where a prominent theory was just sm entirely smashed and left for rubble, right? I mean, no, nobody, no economist of any, even Marxists don't, don't believe in the labor theory of value anymore. It's all, it's all been totally demolished. So that, that's a very rare thing. <laughs> um, okay, so anyway, uh, uh, the, the, uh, the other line of criticism would be, again, uh, the one we mentioned, right, simply to point out that labor, in fact, is paid the full value of its productivity. It is paid the discounted marginal revenue product uh, that it generates, that its labor productivity generates in production. And, of course, if a worker wanted to be paid its full if a worker wanted to be paid his or her full marginal revenue product, they could do so by going to their uh, going to the uh, entrepreneur that employs them and saying, "I'm willing to wait until you sell the output that I'm producing over the next month. I'm willing to wait to be paid." And then the entrepreneur would be happy to pay the full marginal revenue product, right? Because in that case, the entrepreneur is not lending money to the worker up front. He's not paying them in advance of the value that they produce. The entrepreneur can just wait till the customer pays and then pay the worker. And, and the entrepreneur would be happy to do that. In fact, the worker could even earn the full marginal revenue product outside of that by just taking his, full, his pay that he gets up front and then lending it out on in interest. But of course, the worker doesn't want to do that, right? The worker wants to get his income and then and spend it on, on consumption. That, that's why that's why he's willing to take a lower a lower pay. So this is not exploitation. This is just uh, in the sense of uh, you know taking the productivity of the worker. It's a discount of that productivity for uh, intertemporal exchange. Okay, so I mentioned the productivity theory. Let's uh, uh, see if we can go through this uh, somewhat expeditiously. So the productivity theory argues that the rate of return depends upon the physical productivity, fundamentally the physical productivity of capital. And of course, no one denies that capital is physically productive, right? This is just an obvious fact of the world. Well, I mean, not, not every particular capital good might be physically productive, but that it's possible to um, you know, experience a physical productivity. This would be the same, by the way, the same would be true of land and uh, uh, as a factor of production, right? It's physically productive. <coughs> Uh, but physical product productivity affects the marginal revenue product, right? <laughs> it affects what entrepreneurs are willing to pay to buy the input. It, 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 it doesn't even address this question of what, what, what about the intertemporal nature of the payment? The marginal revenue product will be higher, and hence the, the pay up front for uh, buying that input will be larger by the entrepreneur. But this has nothing to do with whether or not the payment up front is equal to the sum of the future revenue that's generated by the productivity of this asset. But it, it doesn't really even address this question, right? Uh, to put the point uh, the other way around, uh, th there's a different productivity, a different physical productivity for all the different capital goods. Right? So backhoes have their own productivity, and uh, apple trees have their productivity, and right? different land sites have their productivity. But the rate of return on investing in all these things is the same. It's the same for a given duration and a given, you know, entrepreneurial uncertainty and so on. It's, it's all the same. That's because the, the rate of return is based upon the difference between what the entrepreneur pays to buy the input and then what the entrepreneur receives by selling the output. It depends upon the value spread between these things and not the physical productivity. So a more physically productive input will be paid a higher price up front because the entrepreneur can use it to generate more valued output in the future. Right? And entrepreneurial competition for the input will push its uh, price in the present up to its full marginal revenue product. You know, and then that would be discounted. And that's where the surplus comes from. <clears throat> uh, another way to think about this, uh, by the way, I have, I have sheep in this example because this was the uh, example offered by Irving Fisher, the famous American economist. 
uh, the uh, founder of American monetarism. And uh, he, he held this view. He, he uh, in part, uh, at least, uh, had this line of argument against a pure time preference theory. And uh, he used sheep as an example. He said, hey, look, if you, have a, if you have a herd of sheep, is it a herd? It's not a herd. It's a, it's a flock. <laughs> if you have a flock of sheep, say 100 sheep, and you, they, they'll just procreate, and you'll have 110 at the end. You don't have to do anything. They just, they're just physically productive, right? Okay, so, so they, they would generate a 10% real return. But what Boombavrik is talking about, what we're all talking about when we talk about interest is not that. Of course, all, all sorts of production processes do that, right? They're physically productive. The, the question is, how much will investors be willing to pay for the 100 sheep? And the answer to that is, what are, what's the productivity, what's the output, what will the output be sold for in the future? And what's the going rate of return on all the other investments that I could make besides sheep? So that's, that's my example here. The capital value, if we assume that the sheep go on forever, the, the sheep flock is, uh, you know, will persist uh, indefinitely, then, then the capital value of the sheep today would be the marginal revenue product divided by the interest rate. So, for example, if the marginal revenue product were $10, in other words, if each extra sheep commanded a price in the future of, of $1, so that there was a $10 marginal revenue product for owning the flock, and... Uh, uh, there was a 10% rate of interest, then the sheep herd could be bought, the sheep herd, the sheep flock could be bought for $100 because that would just generate 10% a 10 return. But what if the return on all the other uh, investments in the economy was 5%? What if you could get 10% as an investor going into the, into the sheep flock, but only 5% on all other investments? What would you do? Oh, well, the answer is clear, right? You'd rush into sheep. And you'd bid, the investors would bid the price of the, of the flock of sheep up to 200. And then they would only earn 5%. See, it doesn't matter, it doesn't matter how physically productive it is, right? Because what we're talking about is a price spread. And prices are uh, the implication of human action. They're the result of human judgment with respect to what's going to happen, uh, in, in particular in the future. <laughs> uh, so this is also true of other uh, cases that Fisher gives. So he gives sheep, hardtack. Hardtack, of course, never changes. It's not, there's zero productivity of hardtack. Uh, it's like beef jerky. It, it uh, you know, la lasts forever and uh, it doesn't procreate or anything. And so, so Fisher said, well, if you had hardtack in this example, then the rate of interest would be zero be because there's no, uh, you know, gain, no physical gain. But this is clearly not the case, right? It just depends on what the other rates of return are on other investments. It, it, it doesn't matter at all what the physical productivity of something is. What matters for the rate of interest is how much investors are willing to pay today to buy the thing, given that they think they can sell the output from it, or in the case of hardtack, they just sell the hardtack in the future, right? The same hardtack, they would just buy it and sell it in the future, what the price will be in the future. So as long as, they can, as long as they can pay a price below what they, what they think the future price will be, then at, at, at the rate of return that they can get on other investments, that's what they would do, right? And, and, and you would generate the same rate. The same is for figs. Figs, of course, deteriorate. So this is negative interest rate, according to Fisher. But clearly it wouldn't be a negative, you know, if we had a market for figs and the figs deteriorate over time, that would not generate a negative rate of interest. Because entrepreneurs know that the figs are going to degenerate and they can estimate from that the remaining amount of the figs that are good that they can sell next year. And they would price the whole buying of all the figs, the whole group, accordingly. They would just underprice, in other words. They would pay only a price lower than they thought that they could sell the re residual output for in the future. Now, since I've run a little bit long, let me just end with it. A couple of things we're not going to get to. You can look at the PowerPoint and, and, and ascertain some of the other points. But I think it's, a, it's interesting to raise this issue with respect to negative interest rates that we claim that, you know, the people claim exist now on the market. So we had this story just last week about how German, uh, German sovereign bond rates have gone negative. Well, you know, think about this for a minute. <laughs> Does it really matter what the coupon rate is on these bonds? If the German government issues a 10,000 euro bond and they say a year from today, we will pay the bearer of this bond 9,990 euros. 
okay, what will investors pay for this? If, if that thing is bought and sold on the market, what will investors pay? And the answer is they'll pay something less than $9,990. And the yield on this, on, this, on this negative coupon rate bond will be positive, unless they make a mistake, right? Of course it won't be negative. Market rates will never be negative. Uh, by the way, the, uh, uh, another as just let me end with this, another aspect of this, of course, is another, another possibility would be there could actually be a holder of this bond that accepts the reduced payment, right? But they'd have to get something in exchange for it. Otherwise, again, they wouldn't, they wouldn't buy the bond unless they were coerced into it somehow. Okay, well, <laughs> think about that. I mean, who, what party, what group of uh, you know, entrepreneurs are required by law to hold government debt? Or, or given at least some sort of uh, incentive to, differential incentive to hold government debt, and the answer is banks. Banks uh, you know, have different capital ratios for different uh, 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 securities that they hold. And their capital ratios are lower for government debt. And so they can actually issue more fiduciary media and get a, a differential gain, right, by holding government debt, even if they have to pay a little bit. To, you know, even if they lose a little bit of the capital value of that, of that asset. Uh, sorry for going long, but uh, all right, thanks. Thank you.